If we want students to be adept at doing laboratory design and doing inquiry both in the laboratory and the classroom, we can't wait until their second year of high school chemistry to start building those skill sets. It is important to have conversations and do vertical teaming with the teachers who teach the students you have before they come to your room uh, in order to build those skill sets early on. Now, I, I teach in a high school where I am the only chemistry teacher, and so I can be absolutely certain that I know what happens in the intro chemistry sequence and that they have certain skills and content that they need to pull forward into the advanced chemistry class. You probably don't have that set up in your classroom, um, and that's fine, but the more you can do to build curriculum across ages, and this means even going and having conversations with the middle school that feeds into your high school, the more you can do to get them to start inquiry methods when kids are younger, the more comfortable they're going to be and the more skillful they'll be by the time they get to you, and you can really stretch their level of inquiry further. Now, many of the experiments that I've done in this series, you can actually adapt fairly easily to intrachemistry and bring it to a level that's appropriate for that grouping of students. But I did want to give you one experiment that I do use in my intrachemistry class, and actually I use this very early on. This is the first lab that they do that they see a chemical change happening in a laboratory experiment. And when I set this up for my students, I actually don't give them the identity of the materials. So I just call it substance X, Y, and Z, and they're to combine them in different combinations and make observations. Observations. The purpose of this activity is just getting kids to the point of making observations in the laboratory and asking new questions, and also to differentiate between what makes an observation and what makes a conclusion. And I have a great amount of sympathy with my students in this point because you know, my first experience with observation versus conclusion didn't go all that well. So I want to demonstrate to you what this laboratory is like so you guys can see the changes that happen, um, but also the requirements that I give to my students as they're conducting it. So when they head back to the lab, um, I tell them just to fill a beaker with about 20 milliliters of water. I'm actually going to take this a little bit larger in magnitude for you guys so it shows up a little bit better on the camera. Uh, and then they get a vial of substance X. And substance X, I'll let you in on the story, is copper 2 chloride. Uh, but they put substance X into water and all they do is they make an observation of what happens first. And this part alone is kind of interesting because you get a substance that is turquoise to start with, and it suddenly turns to sort of a, a bright Kelly green color. And so that alone is an interesting observation to make. And what we're looking for here are how do you have clues that chemical changes are actually happening in an experiment? And color change is one of those clues that might underlie some molecular change happening on the atomic level. Then after it's had a chance to settle, they've made their observation. They uh, stir the solution, and then that Kelly green color sort of gives way um, to a turquoise color. It's very close in color to the color of the solid before we began the experiment. And then they take a piece of substance Y, and uh, substance Y is just a foil. Uh, and they take that foil, they ball it up loosely, so there's still a lot of surface area, and then they just need to push it down into the solution and make some observations. So you guys can probably see that there's a reaction that starts pretty immediately. It's a very, very quick moving reaction here. And I just ask my students in this point to make observations. I'm doing evaluations of the students as I'm going around from lab group to lab group. I'm looking at what they've written down for their observations on their lab paper. And I'm pointing to stuff. I'm like, are you sure that's an observation and not a conclusion? How do you know that that's an observation? Did you collect that with your five senses? Um, or were you making an inference to come up to that idea? So the more you can do as you're sort of assessing the students walking through the lab, point them in the right direction as they're going through this. So this reaction occurs pretty quickly. My students usually jump to conclusions very rapidly, and they say, oh, it's rusting, because they see something that's a rust-colored solid on what was a metal, and it's very obvious that the rusting is a natural conclusion. But I say, do you know that it's rusting? They'll also look at substance Y and say, oh, it's aluminum foil. Uh, and I say, well, do you know it's aluminum? Do you have atomic level vision? And so getting them to the point of understanding just the difference between what you truly can see and observe and what you're actually concluding as the experiment progresses. Then, after they're done making observations on this lab, they put this into the waste beaker. I keep the waste beaker in the fume hood, and they deposit the chemicals there. Um, they work on the second part of the experiment, where they're going to take the same substance Y, and they're going to combine it with a new substance, substance Z. Uh, substance Z is 3-molar hydrochloric acid. And so they fill the beaker with some hydrochloric acid. Approximations are fine here. We have not gotten to the precision unit of our class yet, so I just say use the side of the beaker as your guide and go for approximate volumes. We're just making qualitative observations. But uh, they then rumple up a piece of the substance, Y, 
put it into solution Z and push it down and then have to make some observations. Uh, now aluminum, if you know anything about its chemistry, has a very durable oxide coat. And that oxide layer is actually very difficult to get um, away from a chemical reaction. So this reaction actually takes a good amount of time. I actually pretty much every year have at least one or two lab groups per class that will take this and say, oh, nothing happened, put it into the waste beaker and the fume hood and then clean up their lab. Uh, and you know, they miss the whole point of this is that there's another reaction. But that in itself is a valuable learning experience, that not all chemical reactions are instantaneous. Some of them are slow to progress. Then after this reaction is finished, students go back into the classroom and they and their partner just go through and ask any question they can think about the two systems that they just looked at. What questions do you have about this experiment? Everyone pretty much writes down what are X, Y, and Z, is, you know, is Y aluminum foil, and so forth. But then getting them to focus on the, well, are those questions you can answer experimentally? And focusing them into, could you ask questions like, what would happen if? Or if we replaced Y with, would the reaction be the same? So they start with their huge list of questions. And from those questions, I say, you need to at least come up with one or two questions that you could design an experiment around, that you could actually use a chemical reaction or an experiment in the lab to start to investigate. And they hand all that in. And then we come back to the class later on, usually three or four months later, after we've started to cover chemical reactions and I've gotten a little bit into reaction rate. Um, and then I give them those observations that they had from the very beginning of the year. By the way, if you do this, hold on to the labs until it's time to hand them back. Your students will lose them before it is time and you won't have anything to work from. But make sure you hold on to it. But I say, what are new questions you could design about this experiment? Design a new experiment to go along with your question to try to answer it. And there's lots of variations here. Students could look at, will all metals react with the copper chloride and react with the hydrochloric acid in this way? Will different copper compounds work? Does it have to be copper chloride? Could you do copper sulfate? Could you do copper nitrate? Will all metals react the same way? Could you do this at higher temperature? Would that make a difference? Could you do this at lower temperature? Could you change the concentration of the acid? There are a lot of variations that you can do to this experiment to build some of those inquiry skills early on. But the fact that students have asked the question, they They've wondered, they've gotten curious about it, and then later on in the course, you're giving them a chance to actually act on that curiosity to design an experiment. That's going to build a pretty good skill set that they're going to be able to apply if they take a second year chemistry course. So I'd encourage you, the earlier you can introduce inquiry, the more manageable it's going to be for your students, and the more success they're going to realize later on in their chemistry career.